What is up guys, Alexander here with datepsychology.com. Gonna make a quick video for you today, not a study. I'm gonna go over a really basic concept. I hope this can be helpful to students, psychology students, but any students really in the sciences. So we're gonna go over p-values really simply, what these are, and then three main misconceptions. Misconceptions, I think, if, if we correct these, if we grasp these three main misconceptions, you will probably do better than you know 95% of the people out there trying to interpret p-values and what they mean. So first, explaining kind of what these are here. And no math in this video. Simple, simple concepts. With p-values, what we're trying to do with these statistical tests is compare two groups, sometimes more groups, but let's say two groups. And we want to know when we take one group and another group, right? We want to know is there a difference between these two groups? And if there is a difference, do we know that that is a real difference? What do I mean when I say a real difference? Do we know that the difference is not due to chance, that it's not due to random noise or to perhaps something else going on within those groups? How do we do that? How can we decide basically that we're not fooling ourselves when we see a difference between two groups? And the answer to that, that has been arrived at within frequentist statistics, is going to be statistical significance, right? And what this is, it's the probability that you got the results you got if you assume that the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis being that no effect exists, right? There is no difference between the two groups. That is the fundamental assumption that the math behind these statistical tests is based on, right? The idea that no difference exists, we're comparing the two groups, and we're seeing if we detect a difference if no difference exists, right? Because if we detect a difference, when there really is no difference between two groups, that would be strange, right? It would be surprising. It would be weird. And that's what we're asking ourselves. That's what the p-value is basically telling us, you know? Is this a result that's, that should surprise you, basically? Is this a weird result? Is it something we should not expect, given that the two groups are actually the same. In other words, statistical significance kind of tells you how unlikely the result of getting that small p-value would be, assuming that the two groups are in fact the same. So, another way to think about this, right? Your alpha, that's your cutoff point. Most commonly in psychology, that's going to be 0.05 or 5%, but it could be 1%, 0.5%. 0 0.01, or in other sciences, it could be much, much smaller even. So your alpha tells you basically the likelihood that you're fooling yourself. And this way that I'm explaining it, fooling yourself, that's not my own framing. That's uh, an idea that I got from a statistician. His name is Daniel Lakens. He teaches a course on Coursera. I would recommend checking that out, especially for master's level students and stuff, because it can be more intermediate, but it's a very, very good explanation. And it's an intuitive way to understand it, which is why I wanted to share it with you. Similarly, the statistician Benjamini, he described it the same way, basically that p-values offer a first-line defense against being fooled by randomness. They separate signal from noise, right? Because the difference between two groups that are actually the same, or the detected difference, since we're assuming there is no real difference, could be all noise, right? How do we know, therefore, that an effect is real? How do we know? How do we know? How do we know? p-values, right? That is supposed to be what helps us, not foolproof by any means, but what helps us determine if that effect is real. So, moving on. Three misconceptions about p-values, and understanding these misconceptions, you know, I, we could go into a lot of detail explaining like what p-values are with math and graphs and charts and charts of distributions, that sort of thing. Uh, but understanding these three big things about what p-values are not, will actually help you understand what they are and understand the interpretation of them, uh, perhaps more than, than anything else. So this is something I wanted to cover. I make reference to these often when I talk in the other videos. And of course, you know, this is a YouTube science channel where I cover studies all the time, mostly. Mostly that's what I'm talking about, right? I'm taking a study and covering it. And p-values are used in, I think, all of the studies I've covered up to this point. Most of science is using them. So understanding them, very, very important. Three misconceptions, right? As I said, almost all misunderstanding of p-value falls into one of these three. 
There's a big paper, very heavily cited paper, called The Dirty Dozen, 12 P-Value Misconceptions. So there's others, right? You can look this up. I've put the uh, citation by Goldman is the author. These three things are in that paper, in that list of 12. So there's more P-Value Misconceptions. But at the same time, I think these are the three big ones. So these were the ones that first came to my mind, even before I saw this paper, that I have seen particularly uh, in, I would say, popular science, right? When you read in the media a news article about a paper, even when scientists report their own results to media outlets in, in you know, psychology, pop psychology, pop uh, science publications, psychology today and that sort of thing, a lot of the time they will be reported in ways that are misleading or, or wrong. And a lot of that boils down to kind of a poor understanding of statistics, even at very advanced levels in academia. Kind of a digression, no need to go into that. But understanding these three misconceptions about p-values will help you understand p-values so much, so much better, I promise you. Let's look at the first one right here. P-values do not tell you if a hypothesis is true. Surprising, because we talk about these tests, we call them what, hypothesis tests, right? The idea is that we're testing a hypothesis. And it's extremely common that you will see something reported to the extent of statistically significant result supports the hypothesis, right? Now you can say that this supports a hypothesis across research over the long term as a part of the greater scientific process. But what p-values actually are, are statements about the probability of your data within that specific data set, right? They don't tell you that the hypothesis itself is true. A couple of misconceptions in the way that this is put that you will commonly see this presented. You see a p-value of less than 0 0.05, statistically significant, right? People will say, ah, that means there's a 95% chance that the hypothesis is true. No, no, it doesn't mean that. The opposite of this as well, p-value of less than 0.05%, right? People will say, ah, there's a 95% chance that the hypothesis is false, or could be even worse. They could say there's a 95% chance that the null hypothesis is true, both incorrect. That is not what p-values tell us. What p-values tell us is how likely that result is given the assumption that the null was true, right? Given the assumption of noise to some extent. So p-values test data, not hypotheses. And this, this is not a unimportant distinction, okay? If you want to see how well a hypothesis is supported, you have to look at much more than a p-value, okay? You have to look at effect sizes. We'll go into that momentarily. You have to look at how well the finding is replicated across the sciences. You have to look at support for the hypothesis across the entire scientific process. A good result, a statistically significant result, good so to speak, in a given study doesn't tell you that the hypothesis is supported. It might in the long run across many similar studies over time add to support for that. Let's move on to the next slide here. So, significant but meaningless. When you hear the word significant, the way that we use it outside of statistics in common speech, right? You look it up in a dictionary. It is a synonym with meaningful, right? Something important, something large, perhaps. This is not what significance means in statistics. It means something entirely different. So, statistical significance, it is not a measure of effect size, right? Effect size is what it sounds like. The size or the magnitude of an effect, right? How big a difference is between your groups that you are comparing. So a p-value does not tell you that the difference is large. And this is a big mistake that people make. They will see a p-value that says 0 0.05. They'll say, oh, you know, 95% chance, kind of like we went on in the last slide. Incorrect, but they'll see an even smaller p-value, right? You get a p-value and it's like less than 0 0.00001. And they think, wow, that's a tiny, tiny p-value. That must mean that this effect is really big. No, has no relationship. You can have a, a huge effect, small p-value. You can have p-values that are the same with very different magnitudes of effect. You cannot know anything about the effect size from the p-value. So does a smaller p-value tell you that the effect is stronger or larger? 0.05, like I had said there, no. Perhaps the most uncommon. You gotta look at measures of effect size and what those are, correlations are probably gonna be the most common one, right? Pearson's correlation presented as a little letter R that will give you 
a magnitude of the relationship. And of course, that's a representation of, of the distribution in a graph. You can look and you can visually see the relationship. Cohen's D is a measure of effect size. Even looking at just the actual difference between two means is a measure of effect size. Standardized difference, better, more commonly used, and odds ratio, and there's many other effect size measures that are used. When you look at a paper, guys, and I say this often in the videos, you gotta look for some measure of effect size because people will tell you that it's different, the statistically significant difference, all of that. It doesn't tell you that it's meaningful. Right? It doesn't tell you that it's something that, that you should care about. Imagine a bodybuilding study. Let's say that. And they say, oh, you take this supplement and there's a statistically significant increase in lean muscle tissue. And you think, oh, great, I'm going to buy it. And so you spend hundreds of dollars on, on whatever it is. I guess the common one now is like turkesterone or something. And then you look at the data and you know the effect size is like 1%. And you think, oh, man, I spent all that money for just a 1% gain. And of course, because of the distribution, it doesn't even mean that it's going to give you a 1% gain. So looking at effect sizes, very, very important and statistical significance is not an effect size. Next slide. No difference. This is something you will hear very, very commonly reported in the media and even in papers occasionally, even though they should not. Uh, when you fail to reach statistical significance, you often say no difference between groups. Certainly, I'm sure I have done this very, very often myself. I will probably do this into the future because it is so ingrained in the way that we discuss and talk about results. Technically, it's incorrect. It would be better to say that there is no statistically significant difference detected, right? Because it's almost never the case that there are really two groups that actually have the exact same mean almost never. Groups are almost always different, even if it is just noise. So there's always a difference. And in some cases, that difference could be large. And in some cases, the difference could be large, meaningful, and it could be due to the effect being real. So why would you not have a statistically significant finding if your effect is real? A lot of different reasons for that. So you failed to detect it, right? Well, your study could simply be underpowered. You could actually see from looking at the means in that study and have an idea like, you know, I still think something is going on here, even though I got a p-value of 0 0.06. So I'm outside of the cutoff, but I can kind of see, you know, something is going on here just looking at the means. So you could have a bad study design, right? That simply was not designed well. That is not a question of statistics, but could be a question of your survey, of your sampling, of other methodology, of the metrics that you use. You know, in psychology, a psychometric, a test that you administer. Many things could contribute to why you do not detect an effect that actually exists. So small sample, that's gonna be probably a big one. And if you have a good idea to expect an effect, you think, you know, I'm pretty sure that this should be there and you're not getting it in your research, increasing sample size, probably the best thing that you can do to uh, detect a real effect. So if your p-value has a higher cutoff, you will get non-significant results, remember. P-values are arbitrary. We decide the cutoff. The fact that we use 0 0.05 as a standard in psychology, someone invented that. You know, there's no mathematical reason. There's no objective reason for that. We subjectively said, you know, 95%, 5% sounds reasonable, right? If I'm only being fooled by the data 5% of the time, not bad. And now people are, you know, kind of wanting to shift. Maybe some of them will prefer 0 0.01, you know, only 1%, even better. And if you look at some sciences like physics and that sort of thing, you may see a p-value cutoff that is much, much, much smaller. That will depend a lot in the science and what you are looking at. So the important takeaway here from this is that when you don't detect an effect, right, when you say there is no statistically significant difference between two groups. You're saying, I cannot reject the null hypothesis. You're not saying, I accept the null hypothesis. You never say, I accept the null hypothesis. You say, I have failed to reject the null hypothesis. Why is that? Because it's an absence of evidence, right? It's, it's nothing is there. So you can't say this supports the null hypothesis, kind of what we went into in the previous slide, which is what a lot of people will say. They'll say, there's no difference between groups, therefore no difference exists. No, no, that is not what it shows. Failing to reject the null hypothesis does not provide evidence for the null hypothesis. And guys, short video today because three very simple concepts. Learning these concepts well, 
And learning to understand p-values well will help. It's a big, big step, a beginning step, but a big step to understanding statistics better and to understanding the research that you read and in the long term to designing your own research, to designing your own experiments and all that sort of a thing. So video is over guys. I hope you liked it. Please like, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. If there's other p-value misconceptions, post a comment. I'd like to hear those as well. Like I said, paper in the slides, there's more, but I wanted to go over the three big ones and I'll make another video guys for you very soon.